Because we are going to be going through the longest chapter of Genesis this morning. Um, so, I think uh, Pastor Isaac mentioned announcements, you know, um, many of us just got back from this Footsteps of Paul tour, and I think if you were to ask around, and uh, those who went, um, I think you would get an overwhelming, just, in, it was incredible, it was Amazing. One of the last things that we saw, uh, one of our last stops, was we went to the Sistine Chapel. And as most of you are well aware, the ceiling was painted by Michelangelo, perhaps the greatest artist of all time. Uh, The most famous fresco on the ceiling is the portion that's called the creation of Adam. And we've all seen what that looks like. I did make it PG for you guys. I've seen more body parts this past week than I can care to, (laughs) but God reaching out to Adam there. Now, one thing our guide shared with us before we walked into the actual chapel that I had never heard before, it totally blew me away, is that that shape that that God is placed in resembles the cross-section of a human brain. And the thought is, isn't that crazy? The thought is that Michelangelo wanted to portray that man came from the thought and the creativity of God, okay? He was just a brilliant man, incredible painter, sculptor, architect, all of that. He's quoted as saying, good painting is the kind that looks like sculpture. And the idea is that, I don't think he'd be into abstract art, is that uh, the picture should look like reality, okay? Well, several years ago, one of the young ladies at our church drew a picture of me. And, um, (laughs) yeah, I'm like, is that really what I look like to you? You must be just a terrible artist, kid. No. Well, God uses pictures too. The Old Testament is filled with pictures. It's been said that for every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture. And I think that's because the Lord knows that his kids like pictures too. And so one of the greatest examples that we've been looking at, if you've been with us in our journey through Genesis the last few weeks, is how Isaac serves as an incredible picture of Jesus for us. Lots of different ways, but uh, just the last time that we were together, Sunday before last, we looked at Genesis chapter 22, and we saw that Isaac, like Jesus, they both climbed the same mountain called Moriah in the Old Testament, but called Golgotha or Calvary in the New Testament. Both were obedient to death. Both willingly went along with the will of the Father. Both carried the wood upon which they would be sacrificed up that hill. And for all intents and purposes, both were resurrected. Jesus, of course, was resurrected in three days. But for Isaac, Abraham, we learn in the New Testament, had already reckoned him dead. And he told his men, uh, three days out that you will see us again. He traveled, climbed the hill, and came back to his men. And they saw Isaac again alive three days later. Well, this morning... In chapter 24, uh, we're going to see that this picture for us continues, that God continues to draw for us to to make corresponding pictures of the principle, New Testament principles. And so um, we find that after Isaac comes down the mountain with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, he goes back to his father's house and we don't see Isaac again in the story until the end of chapter 24 when the bride is brought to him. And that's the story that I want us to look at this morning. And so we're gonna be, what we're gonna be doing this morning is we're gonna make our way through this entire chapter again, well, it's the longest chapter in Genesis. But as we do, we're gonna see how this picture comes into focus for us, what we can learn, what we can glean from this, and and we'll do so by throwing in several New Testament verses along the way. So we're going to have, it's probably a little bit more, if you guys have been to a Wednesday night study, it's a little bit more, kind of got that feel. But it says in chapter 24, verse 1, 
Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age. That sounds so much better than old, doesn't it? I'm well advanced in age. Someone told me this morning I was old. Anyway, they should have said well advanced in age. That's what they should have said. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And so, as I said, this picture that we're looking at is going to continue for us this morning. And here we have the father, we have Abraham sending out his servant or his helper. Now, we can assume, if you have been with us, that this man's name is Eliezer of Damascus, who Abraham has already talked about. But the point here in this chapter is that his name isn't mentioned. He doesn't speak of himself. We're not told his name. Now, we're going to look at this verse a little bit later on, but John 16, verse 13, says this about the Holy Spirit. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. The, the Spirit's job is always to point to the Son, right? It's not about the Spirit. It's never uh, through the New Testament. It's never to lift up and amplify the Spirit. It's to, the Spirit exists to point us to Jesus. And that's what we see the Spirit or the servant doing here. He serves on behalf of the Father to bring the bride to the Son, a type and picture of the Holy Spirit. And so Abraham says, I don't want you to get a wife for my son among the Canaanites, so go out there. I want you to go out to the Gentile world and get a bride for my son Isaac. And that's us. We're already seeing a comparison to us. That's where the Holy Spirit was sent on our behalf. That's where he found us is out in the world. Acts 15, verse 14 says, God has taken us from the world and made us a people for his name. And so the Holy Spirit was sent at Pentecost seeking to woo and win people to accept the invitation uh, to be the bride of Christ. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, verse 44, no one, no one can come to the Father who has, uh, unless... Let me start over. Can I start over? Is that okay? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. The Spirit goes out, is sent out into the world, drawing men and women to Jesus, knocking on their hearts, finding a bride for the Son, Jesus. And so here, the unnamed servant, the one that, it's not about him, who serves as a perfect picture for us of the Holy Spirit drawing a bride for the Son. Now, Abraham's servant responds to this request in verse five. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? What if she doesn't come? Perhaps I should bring Isaac with me. But Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying, to your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. This is the promised land, he says. The son isn't to go back out into the world. He, no, the, he, you, he is to prepare a place for the bride. I'm sending you, I'm sending the servant to bring back a bride for him. Well, again, we find New Testament. Jesus says in John 15, verse 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Uh, Jesus says, I'm going to send the helper, I'm going to send the comforter, I'm going to send the servant. All of those could be appropriate ways to translate that. I'm going to send him and he's going to testify of me. He's going to reveal the character and the nature of me, of the, of the Son, of the Savior. Then he adds, Jesus adds a few verses later in John 16, verse 7 through 9, Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. Jesus says, I'm going to go to the Father's house and it's actually to your advantage because I'm going to send him. I'm going to send him out into the world. He's going to convict the world of sin so that they can have this conviction of right and wrong. I'm going to send him to, to point their need to Jesus in their lives and that they can have an understanding that there's judgment that comes from not receiving the son into their life, okay? Well, Abraham, now we continue back in this story as we kind of put this overlay of the New Testament. We go back to the Old Testament. Abraham adds in verse eight, if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. Abraham says, if the one that is called doesn't want to go, you can't make her. Abraham's servant wasn't to, you know, bunk her on the head, throw her over the shoulder, tie her up, and strap her to the camel and say, you're coming with me, right? You guys ever seen Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? They go get those, it's, I love that movie, it's so great. But uh, not because I think that's a good idea, don't get me wrong, I don't, <laughs> that is not good courting. But it's her, it's her decision. She's to willingly enter into this relationship with the beloved son based on the testimony and the drawing of the servant, okay? And so too, that's how the Holy Spirit operates in our life, is he won't force anyone to come to Jesus that doesn't want to. Acceptance of the groom is voluntary. The call will be made, as we'll see, gifts are going to be given. The groom's going to be described as wealthy, as able to provide all possible needs. The spirit will draw. Jesus will stand at the door and knock. But if she doesn't want to come or, the, or we don't want to come, if we don't open the door, he's not going to knock down the door, Okay. Well, verse 9 goes on to say, so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Abraham and the servant, they agree to these terms. They enter into this Middle East custom of loin clutching, which I'm very thankful that we is not part of our culture. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate with any of you what that looks like. Um, anyway, verse 11 then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hand. There's nothing that this servant didn't have authority over. And he rose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Verse 12, then he said, O Lord God of my master Abram, Please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Verse 13, behold, here I stand by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. There's more than one coming, okay? Now let it be that the young woman to whom you say, please let your pitcher, uh, let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, she responds, drink and I will give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. And so he says, the one that you've appointed, okay, and, and, and here we, we see this other side of this complex issue of predestination. Is Rebecca predestined? Is she appointed to be Isaac's wife? Well, we're going to see that, yes, she is. She is appointed. She is predestined to be Isaac's wife. But we're also going to see that she has a choice. And you can say, well, how does that work? Well, is it okay if God's ways are higher than our ways? that both things can be true, that God can say, I have predestined and appointed this person for salvation, but not against my will, that I have a choice to respond in that. He appoints, we respond, okay? And it happened, verse 15, before he had finished speaking. That's how my prayers are. I'm just, Lord just answers them like that, right? No, I'm just joking. That would be great. Um, 
that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now, the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please, let me drink a little water from your pitcher. Okay? You see his urgency. I want to know, is this the one? He's running out to meet her. So she said, drink, my Lord. Then she quickly let down the, her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they had finished drinking. Okay, he brought 10 camels. They, I've heard that camels can drink upwards of 20 gallons of water at a time. That's a, that's a lot of water. That's 200 gallons of water that she's drawing up by hand. She's got some guns as well. She's beautiful with guns, okay? And so she's drawing all this up. And then verse 20, she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water. She drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not, okay? The servant, for us, a picture of the Holy Spirit, how he operates in our life. Isaac is Jesus, but here Rebecca is a picture of us. Rebecca's the bride. She is the church. And she's, she's, he knows that she is the appointed one, that she is going to be the bride by her good works, by what she has done. She sees those who had made this difficult, long journey from the west across the desert, and, and she begins to draw out water from the well for them. And we too, if we're going to stick with us, I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but if we see ourselves as the bride this way, as Rebecca, we should be those who are giving out to others too when we have drawn and find refreshment from the well of salvation. We are surrounded, guys. <laughs> I don't need to tell you this. We're surrounded by those who are wondering. They're thirsty. They're looking for something to quench their thirst. They don't know where to turn. They're trying all the stuff that culture tells them are going to satisfy them, and nothing does. And here we are, those who have taken from the living water, who have had our need meant, and, and if we have that need, we have to be willing to share out of, the, of what we have received from the Lord. Okay, so she's no, we know that she's the appointed one by her good works, but we're also told that this appointed bride is a beautiful virgin, that she's righteous, that she's pure, right? That spiritually speaking, she, she is absolutely beautiful. Now, you might be here and think, I don't feel that way. I know my past, I know my history, and maybe that was true in a literal sense for Rebecca, but in a spiritual sense, you may say that I'm the church, but this doesn't describe me. In fact, I spiritually feel ugly. You don't know the things I've done and what I've said, and it hasn't all been pretty. Well, what we need to understand is that regardless of how you feel, if we've turned from our sin and turned to Jesus, followed him, and replaced in Christ, regardless of how we feel, our feelings will lie to us. We may feel like we're unworthy and unclean, but if we have received who Jesus is and what he has for us, the Lord has made you righteous, completely pure, completely clean. And until we understand this, guys, it, it, we're like the, the, the mouse on, on the wheel. We just keep going, right? We're always trying to make ourselves more acceptable, more righteous to God. If I just do this, if I just do this, I'll just do this, and then God will accept me. You never get to your destination. It's taking up all of your, your energy, right? Uh, but we have to understand, like I said, that it's the Lord that makes us righteous. It says in Isaiah 61, verse 10, I encourage you, if you take notes, to jot this down, put it in your margin. Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. I don't put these on myself by doing good works, by trying to make myself acceptable and beautiful to the Lord. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. 
as the bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. When we follow Jesus, we turn to him and turn from our sin. He gives us the garments of salvation. You don't have to earn them. You don't have to work for them. He gives them to you. He gives you a robe of his righteousness. And so no matter what your history may be or my history, God has made us beautiful in Jesus, holy, blameless, without spot or blemish because that's who he is, okay? So she's appointed. Uh, she's, She's known as the bride because of her good work. She's beautiful. She's pure. Verse 22, and so it was when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring wearing weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold and said, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Verse 26, then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who's not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman, verse 28, ran and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the man by the well. Why? Well, it tells us in verse 30, it came to pass, notice this, when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on her, his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebekah saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man. And there he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Okay, Rebecca is given these gifts by the Spirit. She comes back to her home, met by her brother Laban, okay? And seeing these gifts, his interest is piqued. Oh, this, oh, maybe there's something here. This is pretty interesting. I need to go check out this this guy. Now we're going to read more about Laban as we continue on into Genesis and he may seem nice here but he's going to reveal his true colors. And what we'll see is that Laban in this picture that is painted for us in 20 chapter 24 is a picture of the world. And this is how the world tends to operate. He's attracted to the gifts that the bride has received. The world is initially attracted to the the gifts that the Spirit gives us, the fruit that the Spirit bears in our life. Oh, there's love, joy, peace. Oh, I I like what is going on there. But as we'll see, he likes the gifts that she receives, but doesn't want her to walk with the servant, doesn't want her to walk with the Spirit, doesn't want her to reach her destination with the Son. Okay, we'll see that as we continue. Well, it says in verse 32, the man came to the house and he unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you about my errand. And he said, speak on. So the servant just reiterates exactly everything to this point. It says in verse 34, he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly and he has become great. So he's describing the wealth, the, the, the provision that's available for this bride if she returns. He's become great and he has given him, the Lord has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. Verse 38, but you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk, 
will send his angel with you and prosper your way, and you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. Verse 41, you will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family. For if they will not give her to you, then you'll be released from my oath. And this day I came to the well, and I said, and he tells him about the prayer, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink, and she says to me, drink and I will draw for your camels also, let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Verse 45, but before I finish speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, drink and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank. And she gave the camels a drink also. Verse 47, then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelet on her wrists. And I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Verse 49. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And so he, he just reiterates all of this. You've heard the story from the very beginning, how I got here, how God miraculously led me to that well, right to Rebecca. He answered my prayer exactly. It's obvious that this is from the Lord. This is the appointed one. Are you willing to let Rebecca go? Verse 50, then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Okay, so at this point, things seem to be going exactly according to plan. Everything seems to be great. Dad and brother say, go for it. You know, respond to the servant's invitation. Make this wealthy son your groom. Follow him to the son. Go for it. And then it says, verse 52, it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out Jew, brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Verse 54, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then, notice this, they arose in the morning and he said, send me away to my master, but her brother and her mother said, let the woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. Now, scholars uh, sometimes say, your margin may say, that in reality, they're not saying a few days. Your margin might say, they're asking for 10 months and possibly years. And so what we see here is that Laban and, and the dad originally said, fine, go ahead, but then they say, I, I don't know. We, we kind of want to keep her around for a little while. And so, too, if we continue this picture that's being drawn for us, the world will say, I, I don't know. Man, I like the gifts that you got. I like maybe the change that I've seen in you. But I don't know. This decision to abandon all, to follow him, to leave all that you know for the son that you haven't met, that, might, that seems a little drastic. Let's put it off. Why don't you think about this for a while? Take some time. And that's how the, the, the enemy will operate in our life as well. You know, the story is told, maybe you've heard this before, of three demons. This is fictional. It's not, there's no chapter and verse for this, okay? Can I get that reference? No. That three demons are talking with Satan about how to strategize and how to influence people, how to pull them away from following the Lord. And the first demon says to Satan, he says, what if we try to convince people that there's no God? And Satan says, that won't work. People have a conviction in their heart 
that there is, that they're going to know. You know, you might get a few people that you can convince, but I don't think that's the, the best way to, to keep people from what God has for them. And the second demon says, what if we convince them that there's no hell? There's no punishment. They can just live any way they want. And he's like, well, you'll convince more that way, possibly. But then finally, the third demon says, what if we convince people that there's no hurry? And Satan says, that's, that's what'll work, right? And that's the biggest deception, I think, that we face, is, is that there's plenty of time you don't have to make a decision for Jesus. You can take your time, put it off, wait. You don't have to abandon everything and follow him right now. You can do it when you're older. Live for a while, have some fun, have, you know, enjoy yourself for a little bit. And that's one of the most effective strategies that the enemy can use in our lives, that there's no urgency, that there's no real need to, at this moment, follow Jesus. But the Bible says today is the day of salvation, okay? And so Abraham's servant says in response to this, verse 56, he said to them, do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way. Everything's gone my way. Don't stop this now. Send me away so that I may go to my master. And so they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. She gladly accepts this invitation. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. So based upon the prompting of the servant, upon the information that she's given about the son, she says, I'm going to go in faith. I'm going to go that that's going to be reality. I'm going to give myself to a man I've never met to go to a place I've never been. And again, this is so true and emblematic of our life, of the Christian life. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We've never physically seen Jesus, but we know what the word says about him. We know what the spirit says through the word about him. We know that he's blessed us. We know that we love him because he first loved us, right? So she says, I want to go. I want to follow. And so they send her away, verse 61 then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they uh, rode the, on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came from the way of Beer, Beer Lahoiroi, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Okay, so she comes riding on these 10 camels. Here comes this caravan through the desert to her bridegroom. Again, a picture of our life. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2 that as Christians, our life is like pilgrims. We're, we're, on a so, we're sojourning through life. In fact, Hebrews 13, verse 14, this is how the New Living Translation puts it. For this world is not our permanent home but we're looking forward to a home yet to come. Guys, this life of following Jesus is a pilgrimage. On this pilgrimage, we can have seasons of dryness, right? Rebecca's walking, going through a desert. There may be times we've never been here before. We don't know how we're going to get to where you're bringing us, Lord. It could be a bumpy ride. She's on a camel. I heard that that's pretty bumpy to ride a camel. I can only imagine. But like Rebecca... We're not alone on this journey. We have fellowship along the way. She has the servant to lead the way. Hey, we're going to need to turn here. I know it may seem like this is the right way, but you need to trust me. This is the way to go. This is a difficult area. You've got to stay close to me here. Don't wander too far off. Keep your eyes on me and you'll reach the destination that God has for you. And so this is a picture for us of the spirit-led life. We're not left in this world to just wonder. It's not accept what Jesus has done and then wonder about aimlessly. 
We're to follow the leading of the Spirit in our life. Jesus said in John 16, when he said the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he'll not speak in his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Well, we are coming. Well, we're on the way to the Father. We're being led by the Spirit. I want us to notice what was, what's our greater than Isaac doing. It said in verse 62, he's by uh, Lahoiroi, which means the Lord sees. It's the same well that Hagar met the Lord. He's watching. He's, he's looking out for us. And what's he doing there? While he's doing that, it says he's meditating. He's praying. That's what Jesus is doing for you right now. Hebrews 7.25 says, since he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Lord is watching us. He doesn't abandon us. He's praying for us. He's interceding right now on your, on your behalf. Whatever you're going through, whatever challenges, whatever dryness, however bumpy this ride may be at this moment, he's praying for you and interceding for you. He never stops thinking about you while you're on this journey of life. Well, let's finish here. It says in verse 64, then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. And she had said to the servant, for she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took the veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. These two have never met in person before, but the Lord had prepared their hearts, built up this anticipation for this moment, and now they're consummating this marriage. He's brought her into the tent, and he's loving her. And this chapter... As we close, this chapter is just a beautiful picture of the Christian life. And I think it's a reminder for us as well that we're on a pilgrimage. And on this journey that we're on, and we're all on this journey, and we don't know exactly when our end is going to be to this journey, but we are to trust in the Lord, we're to listen to the Lord, we're to follow the path that he has set for us, and know that he's going to bring us home in the end, and that when he does, even now he's preparing a place for us. And you guys know this passage well. John 14, 1 through 4, says, let not your heart be troubled. You might have something right now that's troubling your heart. And I believe the Lord would say to you, let not... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And so... As we close, again, it's like the fourth time. It's such a pastor thing. I think I've said it four times. But as we close, I want to remind us that the servant's entire mission in this chapter is one thing. It's bring the bride to the son to get her to leave all that she knew and trust in this one that she is going to have a place prepared for her, that it's going to be okay, and that we can trust him. And so I encourage you guys to, to walk by faith, to trust the Lord in this pilgrimage and all that he has for us. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's stand. And uh, I want to leave you with this from First Peter. Let me pray first. Father, thank you again for this time. And I do pray, Lord, for myself, for my brothers and sisters, that uh, we would trust you on this journey, that we would not set our eyes on the things of earth, but set our eyes uh, on you, on that which is above. And know, trusting, Lord, that you are calling us to yourself and that we can walk by faith, that we can walk in the Spirit and know that, Lord, you'll bring us exactly where we need to be. Thank you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.